we're beginning a series about generosity and simplicity, through which we're going to be working uh, working with a book by Adam Hamilton called Enough. Does anybody have that with them this morning? All right. Four people get extra credit. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book, and, and I know that anybody who has spent any time with it thus far has said that it has challenged your, your heart, uh, your life. Uh, it's challenged the way that you look at money. It's challenged the way that you look at uh, how God views your money and how God wants you to view your money. Uh, Mickey and I were, were talking a, a number of months ago, and, uh, and we began to discuss uh, the, the time of year that normally takes place in October, uh, a stewardship campaign. Those who've been in the church know what that is, right? They're like, oh man, it's not October yet. <laughs> in lieu of that this year, we, we decided we would find a resource that just helped us understand money a little better. All of us use money on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a part of our life. And so we began to talk about how we could uh, allow our money to be a, a tool, a resource for our spiritual life instead of something that begins to, to negatively impact our day-to-day -day lives. This is something that everyone, young or old, has, uh, has, has thought about. It's something that, that they deal with. In fact, it's something that I believe that young or old causes us a little bit of stress. Amen? Amen. Anybody in here not had stress around finances? It's coming, buddy. It's not a good thing. You don't want to raise your hand for it. It'll be there. He's my go-to. If I need something, I'm looking at him. He's, he's hands up. I believe that as long as we exist, and by that I mean our society, I mean humanity, we're going to struggle with giving finances, with giving money control over our lives. Uh, the American Psychological Association, or in my house as we refer to it, the APA, <laughs> released a survey of 7,000 homes uh, that, that, that stated that 80% of Americans are stressed about the economy and about their personal finances. And I think that's a really generous number. Most of us, if not all of us, long for a life of joy, a life of, of happiness that simply cannot be found in the stock market or financial institutions or worldly possessions. There's no sin in having money. Money in itself is morally neutral. Have you ever seen money make a bad decision? Just on its own. Without a human person controlling it. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. But as Scripture says, it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Over the next couple weeks, we're going to spend some time talking about focusing our life on the life of Christ and finding our joy and happiness in its true source, true source that is Jesus Christ. And to begin, I want to share a few scripture passages that are going to guide our time together today, but also our time over the next two weeks. The first comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, and this is the second part of that verse. It reads, Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The second is from Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10, and it reads, the lover of money will not be satisfied with money, nor the lover of wealth with gain. This also is vanity. And the third passage is from Matthew 16, 26, and it reads, For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For most people, the American dream has to do with a subconscious desire of, of achieving success and, and satisfying this desire for material possessions. It's an opportunity to pursue more of, of what we have, to gain more than what we have, and to meet success where we choose to meet it. We tend to measure our success by the amount of stuff that we have. 
You ever done that? I know that there have been times when I've bought something or uh, gotten something and, and you, know, you kind of open that package and you're like, wow, I'm pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's just something you've really, you've, you've wanted, and you probably haven't needed, but it's something you've wanted and, and you get that momentary surge of gratification and then it goes away about as fast as it came. We live in a world that encourages us to live beyond our means and that thrives on a have it now and pay for it later mentality. For instance, I don't know how many of you all uh, were paying attention on Tuesday, uh, but, but Tuesday was, was, was a day that, uh, that, that iPhone nerds had been waiting for for some time because uh, they were releasing the next rendition and Apple uh, spares no expense whenever it rolls out a new product, even if it's the same product, just in a different color. <laughs> well, I got sucked into watching the whole address because um, I like to, uh, I, I'm not quite a, a technology nerd, but kind of a little bit. And so uh, I wanted to see what they were doing and, and I heard this rumor that there might be fingerprint technology. Because you can't be bothered to unlock your, pass, your phone by using numbers or a password. How, you know, that's really inconvenient. But, but if you could just touch a button, that would be awesome. I really, really want one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging my, my, my stumbling this week. I've got a, I've got a new phone. I don't, I don't need a new phone. Uh, I don't have a, uh, an upgrade, and so if I went and bought one, Carrie would be very mad at me. Uh, that's, that's another thing. I, I know what my balance and my check is in, in, in the relationship that I'm in, and I know what purchases are, are good and bad, and it's good to have those conversations with those you're in relationship with. But I was really tempted this week. I began to look at, you know, what does it cost, and do I have an upgrade on my plan at all, even somebody else's upgrade. <laughs> that desire is there all the time, whether it's with an iPhone or a car or a computer or a house. You name whatever it is with you, clothing, shoes, it's there. Jenny, I saw you uh, Look away when I said shoes. <laughs> Kurt, Kurt is smiling. <laughs> it's easy to let things that don't really matter take control of my life. I can't get that hour and a half back that I got sucked into watching that address. I can't get the probably another hour and a half that I spent looking at, at pricing and other <laughs> options back either. It's easy to let things that don't matter take control of our life. I want us to be careful to, to, to know that this is not a, when I'm talking about this desire to, to go and buy a phone, that I'm not judging anybody. Um, like I said, I, I probably have the strongest desire for anybody in this room to go get that phone. <clears throat> I want to make sure that when we talk about things like this, we know that it is not to judge one another in any way. We are only in a position to judge ourselves. We know how much money we make, and we know how much money we give away. Conversations like the one we'll be having today and over the next couple weeks are about living a balanced life with God, not who has what or who gives what. In, in the book Enough, Adam tells a story about a, a, a a missionary who comes to a church and, and somebody rolls up in a brand new Lexus. And the missionary starts telling him that, that, that this is exactly what he's talking about. He's, you know, he's passing judgment on this person for driving a new car. And, and Adam pulls him aside and says, you don't need to judge that person. You see, uh, they make more money than anybody else in this room. And they give away $700,000 a year to fund uh, inner city ministries. And he's actually living about five or six levels below his income and he could be driving a Rolls Royce if he wanted. He said, so it's not your place to judge anyone and I want to make sure that, that this is not about uh, this series isn't about judgment in any way. It's about helping us evaluate our lives and match it better to the life of God and the life that God has given us through Jesus Christ. The love of money 
and the love of things that money can buy is primary is a primary or secondary motive to, to what we do as Americans. We consume, we acquire, we buy our way to happiness. We want it now. A little further in the book, Adam talks and he says that the American dream has become the American nightmare. And he points out that there are two conditions that have caused our society to miss understand what a life, uh, what life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is all about. The first conditions, the first condition he said is affluenza. <laughs> affluenza. And that's the, the constant need for more or bigger or better stuff. You really need the phone that hasn't changed much. It's the desire to acquire. Most of us have been infected by this virus to some degree. For instance, the average home in 1973 was around 1,600 square feet. The average size home in 2004? Any guesses? 24. Somebody read the book. 2,400 square feet. Anybody have a guess on what has happened to the, uh, the size of the average household? Is in the number of people during that time frame? It's gone down. Less people, more space, more stuff. Not only have our, our homes grown, but the amount of stuff that we have has grown. There's an estimated 1.9 billion square feet of self-storage space in America. The, the next um, infection that Adam talks about is credititis. And he says that credititis is an illness that has been brought on by the opportunity to buy now and to pay later. It feeds our desire for instant gratification. Our economy today is built on a concept of credit, credititis. Unfortunately, it has exploited our lack of self-discipline and it has allowed us to feed our affluenza, wrecking havoc in our personal and national finances. The average credit card debt in 1990 was $3,000. Vicki is following along in the book. <laughs> Besides Vicki, the average credit card debt now About nine thousand dollars, and this book was written in two thousand nine. So I'm going to bump that up uh, another one or two thousand. The average sale is around one point two five, one hundred twenty five percent higher if we use a credit card than when we pay cash, because we don't feel like it is as real when we use plastic instead of cash. Credititis is not limited to the purchase, purchases made on credit cards. This has to do with car loans and mortgages and other loans. The life of the average car loan and home, home mortgage continues to decrease while the average American savings rate continues. Or those, those rates increase while savings rates decrease. And I'm not even going to get started on student loans. <laughs> I think there is a spiritual issue beneath the surface of affluenza credititis. Our souls were created in the image of God, but they've been distorted. We were meant to desire God, but we have turned towards inward possessions. I told you before that, that, that Augustine uh, has uh, one of the ways that he talked about this, this sinful nature that is humanity is that we were uh, curvatus in se, that we're curved in upon ourselves, that, that our, our natural created position was one of, of praise. It was one of relationship with God. What, what did Adam and Eve do in the garden uh, before they committed sin? They walked with God daily. They were in a, a relationship with God. They would look God straight in the face and they would be honest and they would love. 
And what happened after when God came looking? They hid. They were curved in upon themselves. They were worried about. And, and that desire, that being turned in, begins to feed upon itself and grow. We were meant to find security in God. We were meant to look forward to those evening walks with our Creator. But instead, we have tried to find security in amassing wealth. We were meant to love people, but instead we compete with them. We were meant to enjoy the simple pleasures of life. But we busy ourselves pursuing money and other things. We were meant to be generous and to share with those in need, but we selfishly hoard our resources for them. There is a sin nature like this in all of us. The devil, he knows that this nature is there. And, and, and he makes sure that those uh, TV addresses or uh, those launch addresses for that new phone uh, flash on your, and say, hey, this is happening right now. You want to pay attention. Jesus says the thief comes only to steal to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Does that in John 10.10. 10. The devil doesn't need to tempt us to do drugs or to steal or to have an extramarital affair in order to destroy us. All he needs to do is convince us that we need to pursue the American dream. To keep up with the Joneses. To borrow against our future. To enjoy more than we can afford and to indulge ourselves. By doing that, he will rob us of our joy. He makes us slaves. And he keeps us from doing God's will. I know as I read that, I said, you know what? He's right. That may be one of the, the strongest temptations that I have in my life each and every day. One of my biggest, not just temptations, but sins. Jesus knew humanity. Jesus was human. He was also God. He knew that, that not only had we struggled with this for all of our existence, but that we would continue to struggle with it. That's why he talked the way that he did about money and resources. That's why he lived a life in order for us to follow him. And in Matthew 4, and this comes from verses 8 to 10, Jesus is being tempted by the devil. And it says, the devil brought him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I will give these to you if you bow down and worship me. Jesus responded, go away, Satan, because it is written. You will worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. How many of you, like me, have spent too many hours, too many minutes, too many days worshiping money rather than God? Luke 8, 14 says, As for the seed that, that fell among thorny plants, these are the ones who as they go about their lives are choked by concerns and riches and pleasures of life and their fruit never matures. And again from Mark 8, why would people gain the whole world but lose their whole lives? And this understanding of, of humanity's struggle goes on beyond just the teachings of Jesus into Paul. And, and Paul says to Timothy in, in 1 Timothy 6, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some have wandered away from the faith and have impaled themselves with a lot of pain because they made money their goal. The solution may be simple, but it's not easy. We need a change of heart. Although we receive a, a changed heart when we accept Christ, in a sense we need a change of heart every morning before our feet hit the ground. Lord, make me who you would want me to be. Lord, allow me to trust in you.
to be enough. Each morning, we should get down on our knees and say, Lord, help me to be the person you want me to be today. Take away the desires that shouldn't be there and help me to be single-minded in my focus and pursuit of you. You got a, uh, a little keychain. You got one too, right, buddy? Yeah, you got two. <laughs> and on the front of that keychain, it says, you can read, <coughs> contentment. And on the back, if you would, turn, turn there. We're, we're going we're gonna to read this saying like a prayer right now. I know it's kind of small. Let's say together. Lord, help me to be grateful for what I have. To remember that I don't need most of what I want. And that joy is found in simplicity and generosity. As that prayer becomes a reality, God comes in and cleanses us from the inside out, purifying our hearts and our lives, allowing us to let Christ work within us. Christ works as Christ works in us. We see his kingdom and we strive to do his will. And as this happens, we begin to sense a, a higher calling. A calling to simplicity and faithfulness and generosity. We begin to look for ways that we can make a difference with our time and our talents and our resources. By pursuing good financial practices. We free ourselves from debt so that we're able to be in mission to the world. A key part of finding financial and spiritual freedom is found in simplicity and exercising your strength. Hamilton offers four things that we can do that will begin to simplify our lives. He says that with the help of God, we can simplify our lives and silence the voice of constantly telling us that we need more. For me, that probably means turning off those updates and tell me when the latest thing is coming out and how much it's going to cost. He says that we can begin to live counterculturally by living below, not above our means. He says that we can build into our budget the money to buy with cash instead of credit. We can build into our budgets what we need to be able to live generously and faithfully. To me, this has very little to do with money and everything to do with our hearts and our souls and how we see our finances through our souls. This is about turning dreams that have become nightmares back into dreams. Not the American dream, but the dream of, of the kingdom of God, longing to be with and in and, and through the love of God shown to us through the love of Jesus Christ. And by establishing every other relationship that we have through the relationship that we have with Christ. That means our marriages, our friendships, our work relationships. That means our relationships with our bank and our credit card company and our boss and our paycheck. When that becomes a reality. When we begin to seek and live like that, our lives begin to be transformed in simplicity and generosity. Next week we're going to look at some, some scriptures around contentment as well as exploring some very practical ways to keep our finances in their place as a resource of life rather than something that controls our lives. And I know that that's something that almost all of us here can relate to. And not only am I confident that that's something that everybody in this place can relate to, I know that you know at least one person in your life who has struggled with finances in at least one way. Do you know at least one person in your life? My request of you 
is that you invite them this week. In fact, you can share this little card with them and I'll, I'll replace yours. And offer an invitation that they might come and learn a little bit about the true source of joy and the true source of life and love and liberty and happiness in this world. And it doesn't come from Wall Street. It comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the band to make their way back up. And as the band is making their way back up, I'm going to ask you to pray this little prayer with me one more time. Let us say together, Lord, help me to be grateful for what I have, to remember that I don't need most of what I want, and that joy is found in simplicity and generosity. Amen.